Hi everyone, welcome back to the introduction to FPV drone uh, course on HackerDayU. My name is Ayan and I'm going to be your course instructor. This is the class 2 and I already hope that you have attended the class 1 uh, where we talk about uh, the physics of uh, drones, physics of flying and different components that goes inside building a drone and uh, specifically we discuss about the star of the class that was the propellers and in today's uh, class we're going to talk about uh, the drone frames, transmitters and receiver which are the very vital components. So if you haven't already watched the class uh, one, I would highly recommend you go and watch that first and then come back to this class. So uh, because uh, this class has some prerequisite from class two or uh, class one. Uh, but anyways, without further ado, let's uh, start uh, with today's uh, agenda. So today we're going to be talking about uh, the frame selection and how uh, different things comes into the picture when you are deciding a frame for your drone application. Uh, we'll also be talking about if you uh, there are different materials available uh, in the market, there are different options if you should DIY the frame, if you should buy someone else designed frame already off the shelf or uh, what are the number of propulsion system which are uh, available in a frame and what materials are they made up of, uh, the shape of the frame, the geometry and how to assemble it. So that uh, about the frame selection, then we will be talking about uh, the transmitters uh, and the receivers. We'll talk about frequency, uh, the communication link and how the communication happens uh, when you send some uh, data from your transmitter and how the receiver receives it and it translates to the drone motion of uh, your desire. Uh, we'll talk about uh, frequency, we'll uh, demystify some of the myths uh, behind frequency, power, uh, transmission losses and latency and so on. There would be some maths involved in it. So. Uh, that would be there. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, receiver compatibility. We'll talk about uh, LRS uh, and UHF and we'll talk uh, what they are. So for now, let's uh, deal with the short forms here. Uh, then we will also talk about uh, telemetry and how data is uh, sent back to the ground station to where the drone is uh, being controlled. Uh, we'll talk about antennas and that is a very interesting topic. Uh, we'll see how. We'll talk about what is failsafe and that's uh, the agenda of class two. Uh, that is a today's class. So let's talk about the drone frame variety and uh, when uh, uh, in the last class I mentioned that uh, when I'm talking about drone I want you to think about a quadcopter because uh, uh, drones can be of various type as we discussed in the last class. It could be fixed wing, it could be helis, it could be even the military drone but uh, to be on the same page, to be uh, on the same understanding level, I want you to uh, think of a quadcopter that is a drone with the four, uh, uh, four rotors on the top. Uh, so uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, drone frames and we'll see how different drone frames are available uh, for you to choose from. So on the on the screen, you can see a very small, tiny drone frame, uh, which is also known as Tiny Whoop. Uh, this is a great beginner drone. It is meant to be fly indoors. It is uh, uh, using coreless DC motor, which are really cheap. And this also support FPV. As you can see, there is an FPV camera and a uh, transmitter. So, uh, there are a variety of drone uh, drone frame available and I'll show you in the over at cam of different frames I have uh, with me. But uh, what are the frame options available? Let's see. So this is uh, one of the quadcopter frame which uh, you might have seen uh, uh, the most because uh, it's uh, like a standard uh, size frame, uh, standard shape. Uh, that is the uh, X shape, a very common geometry. Uh, when we talk about the quadcopters, we have four motors, we have landing gears. Uh, this frame seems to be made up of wood. Uh, we'll also discuss what are the advantages of uh, having a frame made up of wood as in this photo versus the one which is made up of uh, plastic as uh, the tiny whoop here. Uh, uh, you also might have seen these kinds of frame and these kinds of frame are especially uh, very common in, cine in cinema uh, industry where uh, they meant to carry some big cameras like DSLR or even some uh, cinema class cameras like Alexa, uh, Mini Alexa. Uh, the standard one or the Alexa Ari, even the red cameras and black magic design studios. If you know some cameras from the film industry, you might know, you might have seen these kinds of drone. Uh, the landing gear which you are seeing are quite elongated. Uh, uh, they are uh, actually being folded. These landing gears fold up when the drones take off and this landing gear comes back uh, to this position when it's landing. Uh, this is also used uh, so it can be it can be picked up uh, by someone on the ground. It can be hand launched if needed at certain area. So that is why this elongated landing uh, gears uh, uh, proves importance and uh, they, they, they keep the operator uh, uh, very safe compared to the one on the on the right side because you can see there is a quite a long gap in the landing gear and where the uh, the motors of the drones are. So it's, it's comparatively safe and uh, we'll see about different frames. So. 
these uh, this is a small uh, DJI Tello drone which you can buy off the market and you can see the there's a small camera maybe you can see there are cordless motor so uh, comparatively these uh, two drones are uh, almost same they have almost same uh, kind of motors the brushless uh, sorry the cordless DC motor they both have cameras I think uh, this can do HD transmission I believe and this is a normal one but uh, these both are quite uh, same but you can see that the design it's everything is enclosed because it's a commercial proprietary product uh, the company don't want to reveal all their uh, electronics which are inside and this is comparatively easy to get inside so I'm just showing you the different drone frames so you get the idea of different quadcopter frames available in the market. Here is another one which is used by the FPV pilots like me for freestyle and drone racing. Uh, we'll talk about uh, how these uh, frames are different in construction, different in geometry and what all uh, flight characteristics uh, it uh, changes as the frame changes. And there's also this funny one, uh, I, I, I think it's funny. I'm not sure about you but this looks funny it's like a very minimal drone and this is meant for FPV racing by the way this uh, the arms are very small the uh, weight is very less because it has very less uh, uh, parts and all but it has a very high speed it can uh, probably go up to 150 uh, miles per hour or something like that because it's uh, very small and very lightweight. Uh, but yes, these are all the drone frames, uh, the quadcopter frames commonly available in the market. As you can see, everyone has different application. So that is the motive of showing you this slide uh, that uh, there is uh, not one frame uh, which is the best for you. There is not one frame which I can recommend you uh, to use. There are uh, thousands of different frames uh, in terms of geometry, in terms of material, in terms of how they mount the electronics. Uh, like for example here you can see all the electronics are exposed here it's inside then uh, why someone choose to expose their electronics versus someone choose to hide the electronics so things like that we're going to be discussing in today's uh, chapter so uh, let me switch to the overhead camera and show you different type of drone frames uh, that i have so this is uh, uh, my go-to fpv uh, drone uh, freestyle frame as you can see so this is a frame by a company called Armaten uh, Chameleon. Uh, so this is a frame from them and I have modified it uh, to suit my needs and we'll talk about uh, modification in future chapter. So this is my go-to frame uh, as you can see. I have some other frames with me as well as uh, like this. So this is a tiny whoop as I showed uh, in the PPT here. So this is the same uh, frame but uh, it's uh, disassembled right now. Uh, there are also a smaller one. So this is... Uh, uh, almost like a FPV racing but this is a smaller one meant for uh, uh, very tight gaps and you know mostly of the fun flying it cannot carry a GoPro or SD cameras but it's it has its own application it has its own needs uh, so yes uh, we'll be talking about uh, frames more in today's uh, chapter so let's continue okay so the very first thing that you need to keep in mind when uh, buying a frame is the frame size so what size you're looking for and uh, if you remember in the last chapter we talked about the propellers and how frames and propellers uh, form a very big constraint that you need to clear on the very early on when you're deciding uh, on what application you need to use your drone uh, so in the last uh, chapter in the in the last uh, uh, class i showed that uh, you cannot use any size of propeller on any drone frame because uh, the frame has some constraint the frame construction in such a way that it may not be able to spin one uh, bigger propeller because of space constraint because of some other constraints so uh, that is why if you have chosen the propellers already you need to choose the drone frame and uh, when you're choosing a drone frame the first thing you need to keep in mind is the size so how do you calculate uh, the size of a drone frame so uh, the size of a drone frame is uh, calculated diagonally, uh, motor to motor. So you, you take any diagonal, you uh, calculate the distance between these two motors, so the center of these motors, and uh, this distance is in millimeters. So uh, uh, if you if you, if you you take a scale, if you uh, measure the diagonal motors you'll, in millimeter, you'll get the size of the frame. So talking about uh, uh, my frame, so this is a diagonally 130 millimeter frame. So from one motor to another motor diagonal, it's 130 millimeter. If you talk about this one, this is more like a 220 uh, millimeter size frame from motor to motor is 220 millimeters. So uh, this is uh, how the frame is calculated, uh, the size of the frame is calculated and that's uh, how the frame uh, are being designed. So it's called uh, the drone frame classes. So a very common class is 450 size frame and when I say 450 size uh, uh, frame or a 450 size class frame, uh, what I really mean is that uh, the distance from center of motor to other uh, diagonal motor is 450 millimeters. 
and that is a very common frame that is a very common size uh, more common before the introduction of fpv drones in the industry uh, because uh, that is uh, like uh, the only frame which was uh, easily available so if uh, this is like a 450 size drone you are seeing this is also somewhat like 500 class frame so yes that's how the drone frames are being uh, uh, size is being decided so if you talk about the fpv drone racing and freestyle the the class which we use it's called 250 size uh, frame uh, which can rotate a propeller of 5 or 6 inches and uh, when we when we say 250 class it, it it has anywhere between 210 millimeter to 270 or 280 millimeter of frame sizes uh, so the frame uh, which i'm using here it is a 220 millimeter uh, diagonally motor to motor so it comes under a 250 class and 250 class frames are uh, meant to rotate propellers from let's say four inches five inches and six inches and so on so that's how you decide the frame if you have already know that you want to have a drone which uh, is running a propeller of let's say five inches then uh, 250 class is a good class to go if you want a drone which can rotate let's say eight inches of propeller then you might need to go for a bigger size of frame like 450 class and so on Okay, so moving ahead, the second uh, factor that uh, uh, is a deciding factor when you are going for a drone frame is number of propulsion system. And this is a very interesting uh, thing to know that uh, uh, why I would want my drone to have uh, three motors or four motors or six motors and what are different characteristics of each motor. So uh, right now I want you to forget that uh, thing where I talk about that drone is a quadcopter and uh, just uh, let's come back to uh, that after this uh, particular uh, slide or, or this particular set of slides. So uh, what is the propulsion system? So a motor uh, and a propeller together form a propulsion system which is actually uh, producing thrust for a drone. So if you talk about a tricopter, it has a three propulsion system, that is it has three motors. So you can see a tricopter uh, by the name it has three motors and uh, each motor is on one arm. So these motors can speed up and speed down uh, to give its roll and pitch axis. But but what about the yaw axis? So uh, we have seen uh, in the last uh, uh, in the last class that uh, to have a yaw motion, you need to uh, vary the speed of a diagonal motor. But this is having an odd number of motors. So how the tricopter is able to yaw on, on, on the degree of freedom of yaw axis. So the answer lies in its tail. So the design of the tail is such that this motor is mounted on a servo motor and that servo motor rotates to give its uh, thrust uh, uh, in a particular direction and we discussed about thrust vectoring in the last uh, class. So that is exactly how a tricopter uh, do its yaw motion. So uh, let me find a quick video for you and where you can see that how tricopter uh, does the yaw motion and it's very interesting to see if you have not seen tricopter before. So let's see. So I am not having the uh, top notch uh, workstation. So there might be some frame drops. I believe in the last video, I've seen some frame drops. So uh, I'll try to mention these videos in the Hacker Day uh, project page so you can refer it later. So let's see if we can find. So tricopter tail servo your motion. I just need to show you a couple of seconds so you'll get the idea of how a tricopter do uh, your so I'm, I'm getting some frame drops already so apologies for that but uh, this is the best we can do so let's see if we can find that video okay so i think uh, this is the one so you can see that the tail of the tricopter motor is mounted on a yaw mechanism on a servo mechanism where a servo motor controls the direction i'll mute this one so this is how the assembly is being done and uh, apologies for the frame drops so this is showing this entire assembly and we are more interested in the working so let's skip here i think this should wait so yes that's the servo motor and that is how the brushless dc motor the bldc motor that i use on drones are being mounted so now you can see that the servo has a property that it can rotate from 0 to 180 degree and using that it will do some thrust vectoring so how tricopter servo works so this video will clear the doubt how the tricopter even though having odd number of motors is still able to yaw so this is a tricopter frame and yes there you can see okay there you can see that how the motor is continuously being changing the direction with the help of servo motor to keep it stable even though having an odd number of motors so that is exactly how a tricopter uh, do a uh, yaw degree of freedom in 3d space so engineering is fantastic and tricopters are really good so the question arises then why do someone would wants to build a tricopter so i want you to see here so 
see this angle between these two motors at the back so this angle is so uh, much that there is no obstruction you can mount anything here you can mount a spray you can mount a camera and there will be no obstruction from this propellers because this is a very very wide angle if you look here it's more than uh, 100 degrees so this motor goes here this motor goes here and still you have a lot of uh, angle you have a lot of clearance here uh, because of this clearance you can mount a camera here no propellers will come into uh, into the into the picture you can mount a jet spray here and even in the in, in the last uh, uh, last class I, sh I show you one video of a drone uh, ambulance uh, made by some university in Netherland. They are also using a version of tricopter. It's basically Y6 which will also come to but they are using a version of tricopter uh, because of the very same reason because this space they are using to mount a screen and a camera to talk to someone who is assisting the patient. So that is why tricopter are very uh, very much uh, used in these kinds of application where you need this uh, big clearance and you will not find this clearance in quadcopter as we'll see in the next slide. Another reason one would want to uh, uh, want to build a, a tricopter is the cost uh, because uh, motors are expensive, propellers and ESCs are expensive. Uh, so uh, when you are having more number of motors, you might also want to uh, uh, have more uh, chances of failure. Uh, so that is why to re reduce the cost, uh, you can build a tricopter. Another reason that is, uh, I know a lot of people have built tricopter in the past is the yaw authority as they used to call it. Uh, because uh, the yaw mechanism is not dependent on the speeding up and speeding down of the motors and it depends on a, a mechanical assembly, a servo assembly, which is a good servo motor, a metal gear servo motor. So it gives the tricopter a very good yaw control, a very, a very good yaw authority and you can do very quick uh, yaw maneuvers and uh, those who have already fly drone, they know that uh, yaw is one of the axes which is really important in terms of flying in terms of handling so that is why there could be another reason to build a tricopter so yes uh, that is a reason if you want to build a tricopter and yes we spend a lot of time talking about tricopters so let's move to the next slide and we'll talk about quadcopter so the very first thing i want you to notice is the angle which i'm talking about so see how this angle reduces compared to the tricopter it has this uh, very obtuse angle and in case of quadcopter this angle is reduces so uh, uh, the first disadvantage of quadcopter is uh, very less clearance between uh, two arms or two propellers so if you are about to mount a camera here uh, high chances uh, these propellers will come into the picture and uh, if you have not mounted it below or, or up there are high chances if you have mounted on the center line that propellers will come into the picture and again if you want to mount uh, something else like display or uh, camera to talk to uh, someone like the drone ambulance then that may hinders that decision. Okay, but talking about quadcopters, uh, one thing which you can notice is uh, these two motors are marked blue because these two motors spin clockwise and these two motors spin anti-clockwise, which we already discussed in the in the last uh, uh, last uh, 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 class. So because of that, uh, it provides a very good stability, a very uh, very stable uh, performance in the air. So quadcopter are really stable uh, drones. Uh, they are. Uh, uh, not aerodynamically stable because they don't have sub some airfoil or something which are reducing drag which we have already discussed but because of uh, these uh, two uh, anti-clockwise and two clockwise spinning motors they cancel each other out and they can be very much stable and if you have programmed it right if you have tuned it right then quadcopter is one of the most stable uh, drone frame which you can build. So yes, uh, uh, another thing which you want to build quadcopter compared to tricopter is uh, one motor will give you more, uh, one extra motor will give you more power and we talked about thrust to weight ratio and it's important so obviously you will get more stability than the tricopter. Uh, next let's talk about hexacopter and as the name says it has six motors so the question is we already have tricopter we already have quadcopter uh, most of the problems can be solved with it then why someone would need to uh, build a hexacopter one of the major reason people in film industry are building hexacopter is uh, so yes so before that I'll, I'll let me tell you that uh, hexacopters are mainly being used in film industry where people wants to mount uh, big cameras uh, uh, where people want to mount uh, expensive uh, cinema class cameras there you'll find hexacopter the very first reason they want to uh, build hexacopter is uh, more power so obviously you'll have two extra motors that will give you uh, 2x more thrust compared to the quadcopter uh, number three is uh, redundancy and uh, hear me out and try to understand this concept so you can see there are three motors which are rotating uh, clockwise and three motors which are rotating anti-clockwise compared to quadcopter where there are only two sets of uh, one set of each 
So if one of the motor or is two of the motor fails in a hexacopter, you still have a quadcopter uh, setup and it is still very stable. So what I mean by that is if you, let's say, is uh, mounting a $50,000 camera, which is uh, not, uh, which is uh, like uh, the cost of a cinema camera, uh, you want some kind of redundancy, you want some kind of fail safe, you want some kind of feature that protects it uh, if uh, one motor fails or two motor fails. And that is exactly what Hexacopter provides. It provides redundancy. If one of your motor or two of your motor fails, you will still be able to land it without any problem. You will still, still be able to control it in the air. So that is uh, one of the major reason people who want to want to mount expensive gears on their drones they prefer hexacopter over quadcopter octacopter similarly more redundancy more power so uh, yes if you still not able to have your uh, payload lifted with hexacopter then you can add two more motors to get octacopter and you'll get uh, another level another layer of redundancy so uh, let's talk about some weird shapes and it's Y6, the same we saw in the last class in the drone ambulance. So what exactly is happening here? So uh, you want, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to change your frame. You don't want to add, uh, keep adding motors because at one time you will, uh, you will exhaust the available space and you will not have enough clearance between the propellers. So if we talk about hexacopter, see there is very less clearance between the propellers and uh, you are prop uh, you are basically exhausted the, sp uh, the space available to you and your propellers cannot spin. So what you'll do? So ingenious have come up with great ideas that instead of mount keep mounting motors on one axis, let's mount motor on uh, the below axis. So you have three motors on the up and three motors off on the below. So that is how a Y6 work. It is basically two tricopter uh, attached back to back, uh, one on the top and one on the bottom. Uh, when you have a Y6, uh, you'll see in the tricopter all motors are spinning in the same direction, but in the Y6 there are uh, two sets uh, of different motors spinning uh, on different direction, which cancel out each other and you don't need a servo mechanism as a tricopter did. So in the similar way, uh, if you can mount a motor downwards, uh, why not mount four motors downwards and get an X8 that is basically two quadcopters. And similarly, you can uh, mix and match a number of propulsion system and uh, you can get these kinds of frame configuration. So, so far we talk about the drone uh, size and the different shapes uh, in which you can make the drone. Okay, now let's move ahead and talk about uh, different materials that you can use to build drone frames. So basically no one is stopping you to use any kind of material to build the drone you want. Uh, but there are certain materials that are being used already by different uh, drone frame manufacturers by different people around the world. and. Uh, there are certain factors that uh, are kept into consideration while building or uh, buying a drone frame and uh, I have listed there in a table it's uh, cost, durability, weight and signal interference. So uh, as I already mentioned in the last class that uh, when you are uh, talking about drones everything is a trade-off. Uh, you will gain something but you will lose a couple of things and vice versa. Uh, that is why you need to find a sweet spot. You need to know on what particular ground you want to compromise on and on what particular ground you don't want to compromise on. And I'll give you a very uh, sweet example uh, what I meant by that. So uh, let's suppose I am a drone racing pilot and uh, I am flying drone at a very high speed. So what uh, can I give up uh, there and what uh, I cannot give up there. So uh, definitely I cannot uh, give up uh, on the weight. I want my weight to be as low as possible. That is the only way I will uh, I will be able to attain higher speeds. Uh, I can give on the cost because I know that if I'm participating in a drone uh, races, uh, people will come uh, there as my competitor with all kind of uh, uh, drone frames with all uh, best kind of material and we are basically competing for a prize money so cost is not a factor there. Uh, I cannot give up on durability because uh, when you are racing uh, you want your frame to be durable uh, if, even if there are lighter crashes you are able to make repairs and you are uh, ready for the next heat and so on. So this is uh, uh, an example I want to give and talk about the sweet finding the sweet spot. So. Uh, let's compare different materials. So on the left you can see that uh, these are the common materials which are being uh, used uh, for making drones. It's uh, wood, uh, plastic composite, uh, G10 uh, or fiberglass or carbon fiber. So uh, let's talk about wood. So uh, wood basically costs very less. So there are different woods uh, materials which are being used in making drones. 
uh, I am not sure, but I think pine wood is one of them. I have built a, a single or a couple of wood frames uh, in the past, uh, mainly for tricopter. And uh, there I only want uh, it to carry a GoPro and don't do any fast maneuvers like I do with my FPV freestyle drone. So that is why I'm not concerned about the durability. So wood can break easily, but because it is so cheap, you can uh, replace it uh, with a new part. So uh, you can carry extra, extra parts with you. You can uh, make uh, replaces on the go. So that is why the cost of the wood is uh, very low and also the durability is also very low. You crash, you, uh, you'll break an arm or something. Uh, I also want to mention here that when I talk about durability, it's not only the frame durability, but also the protection frame provide to your electronics. So, uh, basically what is a drone frame it is nothing it is a house of all your drone electronic components and if uh, the frame is not durable it will break very easily there are high chances that it will also break your components uh, for example if uh, your drone arms break on the arms you have mounted your ESC there may be ESC uh, wire breakage and because the battery is connected there may be short circuit and uh, your entire electronics uh, fry and the magic white smoke comes out and the possibilities are endless so uh, do also keep that in mind that durability is not just the frame durability but also the the housing the shell it provides to other components uh, talking about the weight that is a big uh, uh, factor for not choosing uh, wood as an FPV uh, racing or FPV freestyle drone because the wood is very heavy and uh, the heaviness of wood is not suitable for such kind of application. Uh, but on uh, one good uh, end, there is no signal interference uh, with the wood. Wood is not conductive. So there is no signal interference. And I will talk about signal interference when we will talk uh, about the other materials. Now let's talk about plastic composites. So uh, some drone manufacturers, what they did, uh, they are using some plastic polymers, uh, which are very uh, durable, which are uh, also very lightweight. I think ABS is one of them. Uh, there is a TPU, which is also flexible. So it will uh, never break. It's like flexible materials. You can never break. Uh, break them uh, so talking about plastic composite uh, the cost is mm, it depends uh, on uh, different frame manufacturers and different uh, polymers which are being used in cost so cannot really comment so if it's a high quality plastic composite it would cost more if it's a low grade plastic polymer it will uh, cost less uh, uh, there are some plastic which are mixed with resin and something i i don't know i'm not the best uh, best guy to comment on that but yes uh, i'm not really sure uh, the cost of the plastic it would totally depend on the material durability wise they are good so uh, i have seen uh, some plastic frames floating in the market and even in drone racing uh, we are using plastics uh, to enforce the frame and the plastic I'm talking about is TPU. Uh, it's a flexible plastic, so it doesn't break. And uh, yes, uh, they are being used and they are quite durable. So that is a good uh, thing with the plastic composite. Uh, on the weight side, I cannot really comment. It depends on the density. So uh, these uh, frames are generally injection molded. Uh, you may also find some 3D printable frames, but I'm not talking about them particularly here. I'm talking about injection molded frame. So how much dense they are, the density of the material that uh, will totally uh, dictate the weight of this frame. So I, uh, so I have left that uh, particular section. On the signal interference, again, plastics are not um, conductive, so there is no signal interference. So that is a good thing. Uh, I have marked that a red cross, but that is uh, actually a good thing. There is no signal interference. Uh, that's what I mean by the red cross. Okay, so moving ahead, there is another uh, material which uh, is being used in making drone frame. It's uh, quite uh, popular a couple of years back because it's uh, relatively cheaper than carbon fiber and it's G10. So compared to wood and plastic composite, it's definitely uh, expensive than that, but it is uh, far less expensive than carbon fiber. Uh, durability wise, uh, it uh, totally depends on the manufacturing process. So what a G10 is, it's basically a, a sheet of fiberglass and they are uh, sandwiched together and uh, uh, they are uh, uh, they are pasted using epoxy and the density of epoxy, the quality of uh, resins used to make that epoxy and so on, uh, that detects a durability. So I've left that one. Uh, the weight is uh, uh, very high. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, quite heavy compared to the carbon fiber. So that is a downside of it. Uh, signal interference again, uh, fiber uh, glass is not uh, conductive uh, out of the box, so there is no much signal interference. Now let's talk about carbon fiber, the uh, most uh, famous, uh, the most favorite uh, material of uh, building drones uh, these days. The cost is extremely high. 
carbon fiber is uh, really expensive and to make uh, to find good carbon fiber it's also not an easy task and uh, what is basically a carbon fiber is it's uh, the fibers of uh, graphite and uh, some other uh, carbon composite material and they are uh, made in a sheet uh, sandwiched together again uh, again uh, st- stacked together and paste uh, using epoxy uh, on the durability side they are very very durable carbon fiber is one of the most uh, durable component uh, sorry durable material which uh, you can use to build drones and uh, depending on how you uh, post process or how you uh, do some kind of uh, things uh, before making drone it can be more durable uh, for example uh, what uh, we as a drone uh, builder as a drone pilot do is uh, we chamfer the edges using a very uh, very uh, high grade file and then we put some uh, super glue on the edges and that gives uh, extreme durability even in crashes so carbon fiber is extremely durable uh, weight side is also good it's not very heavy uh, compared to g10 and wood it's a uh, quite uh, lightweight so that is why it's also uh, another favorable uh, thing so uh, everything is good in carbon fiber so what's wrong so the wrong part is signal interference because uh, carbon the graphite is a uh, uh, conductive material and when you are talking about uh, frequency we on the drone we have 2.4 gigahertz for rc link we have 5.8 gigahertz for video link so carbon fiber uh, if uh so basically, uh, consider it like this. So carbon fiber is conductive, but uh, the epoxy and the the coating of uh, uh, the layer on the top and the bottom, that is non-conductive. So uh, out of the box, the frame you will get that will not conduct electricity. But uh, uh, after some time when you are crashing, when you are uh, getting rid of that particular coating on the top and on the bottom, uh, the conductive parts, the fiber of the carbons, they start appearing up and that is uh, conductive in nature. That can... Uh, that can do some short circuit if there is some voltage leaking on the drone and that is the major part which is uh, responsible for signal interference so signal interference happens in the carbon fiber if the frame is not uh, maintained Uh, so what could be the best of this both worlds so in the engineering everywhere we are seeing that uh, the the engineers the manufacturer they, they take some good part of this world they take some good part of this world and they come together so I'll show you my drone frame. So I'll quickly uh, go to this overhead camera and you can see this is the drone frame which I'm using. So carbon fiber, very lightweight, very durable. There is signal interference, but that's okay. Unless uh, you are maintaining your frame, there is no problem. But carbon fiber is also soft at some points and they can break. They can, uh, they can, uh, they can, uh, get, uh, they can get worn out over the period of time. And what these manufacturers are doing, they are, they are using metal parts so you can see here this is a 70 75 uh, aerospace grade aluminum uh, aluminum and this is being used to enforce the carbon so this is the best of the both world i'm um, uh, getting a metal where it is necessary and carbon fiber on the rest of this place so why we cannot make the frame of this metal and why there is no metal on my slide uh, that is because uh, metal is quite heavy and that is not a suitable thing and metal is conductive as well so any leakage can cause short circuit so but uh, the best of the both world is carbon fiber uh, with aerospace uh, aluminum which will give its uh, durability where it is necessary so there is a front end collision the aluminum will protect it otherwise the lightweight of carbon fiber is a uh, goodness so that is how the frame manufacturers are coming up with the best of the both world and i think that is a way ahead all right so let's talk about uh, the quadcopter variants in drone frame and i want you to come back to that uh, same thought process that whenever whenever i'm saying drone you think about quadcopter the drone frame with four motors so before that uh, let's talk about different uh, thing that change the flying characteristics and the first thing is center of gravity so uh, the center of gravity is the balancing point of uh, any body and the drones are no different uh, they balance at a particular point where uh, they have equal amount of balance uh, in all uh, direction in 3d space so uh, center of gravity if it changes uh, because of uh, external part like uh, battery is one of the uh, one of the component of drone which carries uh, most of the weight so uh, you can change the center of gravity of point by changing the position of gravity uh, changing the position of battery uh, uh, in the drone so uh, that changes the flying characteristics how your drone uh, is uh, flying so other thing is uh, if uh, uh, your drone frame has less material overall compared to another frame which has uh, thicker arms if your <clears throat> if your drone frame has thinner arms and so on that would have less drag and we discussed that in the last class that 
uh, the shape of the uh, the shape of the material and the amount of the material which is exposed to a fluid that contributes to the drag so uh, less material your drone frame have less, less drag it would have uh, this is the most important part that is the better balance is uh, less work for flight controllers so uh, in the last class we discussed that uh, uh, aerodynamically drones are unstable they rely on sensors they rely on onboard computers to maintain a balance to maintain a stable flight so if your center of gravity is off, if uh, your drone frame is not perfectly balanced, so more work has to be done by flight controller to keep it balanced. So uh, let's say if I move to the overhead uh, camera to show you, let's say this is your drone uh, frame uh, and your center of gravity needs to be at the center. So all the motors are doing equal part. But for some reason, the frame manufacturer was incompetent and they designed the frame such that the balance is at the back. So uh, ideally, your drone would always be flying tilted uh, this way. So what your flight controller have to do is always instruct this motor to spin uh, relatively at higher RPM than these two motors so that the drone can stay at balance. So what is happening here, your flight controller have to do more work, uh, your uh, uh, one set of motor needs to do more work and that is a lot of work and that is a lot of computation. So overall, you will get uh, a very less uh, uh, adequate performance from your drone. So that is also uh, uh, an intuitive unsaid thing uh, that goes inside uh, when choosing a drone frame. So better balance, uh, better center of gravity, uh, less material that all accounts to a good quadcopter frame. So these are all the variants uh, where uh, you can find different quadcopter frames. So I have listed that on the left and on the right you can see their photos. So we have a uh, X type quadcopter also known as True X. Then we have H type. Then we have hybrid X. I'm sorry it's not hybrid C, it's hybrid X. Uh, then we have stressed X and then we have dead cat. So this is the True X frame which is in the shape of uh, X or a cross. Uh, this is a H where it's in the shape of the H. So you can see there are four motors on all these, but uh, the arrangement is uh, quite different. It's X here, it's H here. Uh, this is a stretched X where you can see this angle is more compared to this angle. While on the true X, these uh, the distance between these two motors and these two motors are same. Uh, whereas in stretched X, the distance between these two motors is higher compared to these two motors. Then you uh, you take the H, you take the X and you'll uh, you'll end up with hybrid X and square is also another kind of frame. Uh, uh, another special kind of quadcopter is a dead cat as you can see here where the angle uh, in the front two arms is greater than compared to the back two arms. So uh, let's talk about all these frames. So again, center of gravity uh, on all these frames, uh, the X type, the H type is different. And we have discussed that because of center of gravity, there is a different in flying characteristics and we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, less material is equal to less drag and that is why you can see uh, this uh, small quadcopter here. It's uh, called a toothpick drone because it has very, very thin arms, a very, very thin surface area exposed to the air. And this can go up to very high speed because of uh, less drag. So uh, this point holds valid in these kinds of frame. Uh, battery balance is equal to less work of flight control as we already discussed. So uh, in, in the X, there is a very good balance because of the distance between these two motors and these two motors are same. So there is very less uh, computation this flight control have to do. Whereas in something like uh, H uh, or the hybrid X, it's, it's, it's quite different and the center of gravity and balance is a bit off. Uh, especially in the in the dead cat as you can see there is uh, a shift in the center of gravity because of different angles of uh, back and the front arms so flight controller has to do more work uh, but the question is uh, why would anyone wants to choose these kinds of uh, uh, different uh, different quadcopters all these are quadcopters all these are four motors uh, we discussed that there are tricopter hexacopter but now uh, why quadcopters in different configurations so uh, consider the true X uh, that is uh, one of the most stable quadcopter the uh, most uh, uh, balanced quadcopter so that is why if you're looking for stability you can uh, go with that but the downside is uh, look at the space in the center there is very less space you will get to mount your electronics uh, you cannot uh, fit everything in the X frame that is why uh, the drone manufacturers the frame manufacturers they go for the edge configuration there you can see you get this bus like structure in the center where you can put your GPS, your flight controller, your video transmitter and antennas and so on. 
uh, when you want uh, the stability of an X and you want the space like H, then you go for the hybrid X where uh, the balance is like the X, the stability is like the X, but you also get more space to put all your electronics. But uh, the downside is uh, then this will have more area exposed and it will have more drag. So again, I mentioned that uh, everything is a trade-off uh, when you are building such things. So you need to find your sweet spot. Uh, the, uh, the need for stretch X is... Uh, so when we are racing, so stretch X are recently uh, very common uh, these days because of drone racing. Uh, so because of this uh, weird uh, distance between uh, two set of motor, uh, the stretched X kind of drones are uh, very, very agile, very, very maneuverable in uh, in close turns and, and in any uh, proximity flying kind of situation. Uh, so remember in the last uh, in the in the last uh, video we talked about uh, the uh, how jet uh, jet airplanes are using instability design uh, as as their advantage uh, for their advantage. Similarly, stretched X uh, because uh, the balance is off, uh, the air uh, the air will not compensate uh, for uh, its stability. They will not provide for stability, so it can use this instability for its advantage and get high. Uh, maneuverability high agility and it's very easy uh, in the in the sharp turns for pilot and the turns are very hard uh, when you're drone racing so stretched x frame especially are used by drone racers for the uh, agility purposes uh, now similarly uh, if you if you see the dead cat configuration of quadcopter see how the arms are uh, in different angles so 70 degree of uh, angle between the front two arms and almost uh, uh, 50, 50 degree in the back two arms so why is that uh, do you notice the small camera here? So that is the reason. Remember when I talked about the quadcopter, I mentioned that uh, the quadcopter is not uh, like a tricopter where you will get a very, uh, very, very good angle in the front so you can mount all your, all your cameras and the propellers will not come into picture. Uh, well, guess someone has uh, has a solution. So uh, what they did, they they make the front uh, front angle a bit more steeper so you can mount this GoPro like cameras and still not get propellers into picture. But the downside is you will lose some stability. It's not a perfectly X. The center of gravity is uh, way off and the flight controller will have to do more work. You it's it's very uh, you will have a very hard time tuning it or uh, uh, making it stable. So that is the overall trade off. So you need to decide. Uh, talking about me, I, I fly. Uh, this kind of configuration hybrid X or uh, uh, H kind of uh, quadcopters more uh, but these days uh, people are shifting to true X and stretch X because of stability and uh, the components are getting smaller and smaller uh, the receivers were used to be very big couple of years back uh, they are comparatively smaller uh, these days so you can fit a lot of uh, parts in uh, this small area so uh, people are making a shift but again you need to decide for your own particular application Okay, so here is uh, another table uh, which I created. So on the left, you can see uh, different uh, drone configuration and on the right, on the columns, you'll see space, stability, agility, durability and field of view. So talking about a true X frame, there is very less space, but the stability is very high. Agility is also high. Durability, again, uh, depends on how good the frame uh, manufacturer has uh, uh, provided uh, to keep the electronics safe. Field of view, you don't get a good field of view because the propellers are uh, very close to each other. In the true edge, everything is good except for agility uh, because its uh, center of gravity is again off. So more work has to be done by flight controllers and motors to keep it stable. And there you lose the agility. Uh, hybrid X, uh, uh, the, this one, the frame which I use, uh, the, uh, the FPV drone pilots and uh, freestyle pilots and race pilot use, it's uh, good in every department. Uh, stretched X again, there is a space issue, but again, it's good. Dead cat, uh, you will, uh, you get a very good field of view, but uh, you have to compromise with stability and agility. Uh, so a small uh, word about drone frame assembly. So every drone has uh, a different uh, uh, structure. Every drone has a different structural component and different uh, physical components. And uh, you need to consult the manufacturer. You need to consult uh, uh, some documentation which comes with it uh, to assemble it. And if you are uh, DIYing your own drone frame, then you know what to do. But uh, uh, let's uh, shift to an overhead camera and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So uh, this frame particularly comes with a single bottom plate and a top plate and this particular part you need to assemble using the screw. Uh, this frame is comparatively very easy to assemble it just one bottom uh, part and a top part. 
uh there are some another unassembled frames i have which are mostly used for drone racing so this is one frame designed by my friend so this has a, a dual arm like structure so you'll get two arms in one uh, body uh, you have a bottom plate and then you put some stand off and then you have a top plate so what i'm trying to uh, say is that every frame is different and when assembling a frame you need to consult the manufacturer documentation and if any chance if you are building your own frame like a lot of people do then you know what you are doing so that concludes uh, the drone frame selection uh, uh, part of uh, this particular class and as i already mentioned in the first class i'm i'm not going to recommend a one particular kind of frame or any part Uh, so you know what uh, best your application is but i can surely show you what i use so i use uh, this armiton chameleon frame which is a very good frame and armiton is a good uh, frame manufacturer this comes with a lifetime warranty uh, i'm not sponsored by armiton or anything but that is just what i use so if you are interested into that okay so now moving to the next uh, part of uh, this class and this is very interesting and a lot of things we need to discuss so let's quickly talk about uh, transmitters and receivers and uh, let me show you how that looks so here is my transmitter and transmitter is your best friend in the hobby and when i say best friend it uh, i mean that this is the one thing where i will not recommend anyone to compromise uh you can compromise on drone frame you can compromise on other components you can buy cheap one but never buy a cheap transmitter never compromise on the transmitter please go for uh, at least a good transmitter like this one this is the fr sky taranes x9d plus a bit expensive transmitter but there are also some cheaper version from the same company like uh, fr sky qx7 uh there are also some more cheaper one by uh, other cheap companies but i will not recommend that because this is the something which is uh, going to be your best friend you are using this to control your drone this is where the signal is coming from and if you lose the signal you will lose the drone you will put people life into danger so that is why I never compromise with transmitter so let's talk about the communication link so transmitter is uh, the remote of your drone uh, transmitter is uh, the part which you are keeping in your hand to control the drone of course if you are trying to make an autonomous drones then you don't need a transmitter but again uh, there are some cases uh, even in autonomous drone where you need transmitter to feed one time information or so so transmitter is uh, the remote which you keep in hand which you use to control your drone receiver on the other hand is uh, the component which stays on your drone which uh, receives uh, the command the input from the transmitter about uh, the roll pitch uh, your access the throttle and uh, how you want your drone to react so this uh, stays in the drone and they communicate uh, together over a radio frequency link so they work on radio frequency uh, rf channel if you are not familiar with the rf uh, frequency it's basically electromagnetic uh, uh, electromagnetic uh, carrier waves which carry information uh, what kind of information so it carries in this case it carries info uh, information uh, of roll pitch yaw and throttle how much yaw you want how much degree per second of roll you want how much throttle uh, you want uh, your drone and what's the overall attitude you want your drone to behave so uh, talking about the communication link uh, the uh, transmitters and receivers generally work on ism band that is a 2.4 gigahertz so there is a frequency band available which are free to use around the world it's called ism band uh, your routers work on that uh, wifi or bluetooth works on that and lot of different uh, things which uh, do not require any license work on that so again uh, 2.4 gigahertz is a ism band and if you are using the ism band in a in a in a restrict power levels then you are free to use without any license uh, for example uh, in india where i come from if you are using uh, other frequencies which are not a part of ism band then you need a ham license then you need a, a special permission from communication uh, ministry of the government to do any uh, any communication on that frequency but 2.4 gigahertz under a certain uh, power range is free to use and yes these transmitters have a, uh, have a power on which this transmits the signal if i talk about the uh, radio transmitter which are used in drones and uh, rc hobby the general uh, transmitting power is around 10 to 15 milliwatt and that gives you a range of around 1 kilometers in a good uh, line of sight open space uh, which is good enough and we'll also talk about how to increase that and stuff like that in later slides okay so uh, 
uh, one question which could arise is uh, uh, i want uh, to fly with my friends we have 10 friends we all have drones we want to fly together will there be any interference and that is a really good question and to answer that it it's it's not uh, there will be no interference but how is that possible when everyone is flying on the same frequency so the answer lies in a thing called frequency hopping and what frequency hopping means that uh, the transmitter and receiver they decides that we will be keep on changing frequencies uh, every uh, certain time and we will know uh, we are hopping from one frequency to another at the same time so we can communicate and this uh, frequency hopping allows a lot of pilots to fly together they allow a lot of people to use uh, fame, uh, same frequency without interfer interfering one another and there is a very 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 steep very less chances that you will end up interfering with some other but that is uh, not really the case that i have seen uh, in big rc events around 200 people flying together without any problem and that is how frequency hopping uh, work so frequency hopping is uh, built into the transmitter and receiver and when you bind the receiver with the transmitter they agree on uh, the algorithm used for frequency hopping and uh, that allows a lot of uh, pilots to fly together uh, so 2.4 gigahertz I told you is the ISM band which this uh, radio uses but you can also use 900 megahertz and 433 megahertz depending on where you are in the world or if you are allow allowed to do that. Uh, you can also extend the capabilities of this transmitter which uh, we'll also talk about in later slides. Frequency limits as per local transmission laws so that holds true for everywhere in this world so government controls uh, what frequencies you can use what frequencies you cannot use what power levels you use so uh, please consult your local uh, radio transmission laws uh, before uh, doing anything uh, which may land you in problem like illegal transmission on illegal frequencies. Uh, might need a ham license to transmit certain frequencies that holds again true if you want to do some uh, frequency related uh, stuff you want to transmit in some certain frequencies you might need to apply for a ham license and generally uh, you need to give a test you need to uh, give a test on electronics and antennas and uh, uh, radio frequency to get this ham license so uh, if you are serious in this hobby and you want to continue pursuing it it's also a good idea to take that license as well Power of transmission is also limited by local laws as I mentioned that these transmitters they work on 10 to 25 milliwatt uh, which is good enough it will give you a range of uh, around 1 kilometer on or 1 mile depending on what is the power level and that is a good uh, enough range. Uh, range depends on a lot of different factors which we will also uh, uh, be talking about in great details but uh, one such factor is like uh, how dense uh, uh, in an area you are flying so uh, if you are flying in an area with a lot of buildings lot of concrete walls then you will obviously have less range compared to if you are flying in open space where you have good line of sight uh, for your drone and uh, such kind of things and also where your antenna is facing at a particular time and what is the direction of a receiver antenna that also matters a lot so we'll talk about that in coming slides now let's talk about uh, frequency uh, rf power data rate and range so uh, when i when i was teaching uh, uh, about drones in my in my local area to uh, my students uh, there is a common misconception and that misconception is that more the frequency more is the range so they think that 2.4 gigahertz frequency will give them more range compared to 900 megahertz and that is a misconception and that is not true in fact uh, at same power level and at same modulation lower frequencies will give you more range example 900 megahertz will give you more range as compared to 2.4 gigahertz but uh, that is one when you are comparing apples to apples and not apple to orange uh, make sure that when you are comparing any frequencies they are transmitting on same power levels obviously Obviously, if 2.4 gigahertz radio is uh, transmitting at higher power level, you will get more range. But if they are on same power level, they are on same, they are using same modulation technique, then lower frequencies will give you more range. Also, lower frequencies, uh, uh, a wavelength are bigger and therefore they have better penetration. So, it's a simple formula. C is equal to mu lambda. C is the speed of light constant. Uh, that is 3 into 10 raised to power 8 meter per second uh, mu is the frequency and lambda is the wavelength so by this formula uh, frequency is inversely proportional to wavelength so more the frequency less is the wavelength less the frequency more is the wavelength so obviously 900 megahertz uh, signal will have more wavelength a bigger wavelength and uh, uh, it will give better penetration capability so it can penetrate better through walls and uh, concrete structures and whatnot compared to higher wavelengths 
also more data rate is equal to less range so uh, uh, what i mean by that if you are transmitting 2 megabytes uh, 2 megabits per second you will get uh, less range compared to if you are transmitting let's say 2 kilobytes per second so uh, you need to make sure that you are only transmitting the uh, uh, minimum amount of data and not uh, excessively using the channel uh, because there are certain concept which are involved and which uh, reduces the range these are out of uh, scope uh, for this particular class but uh, i'll i'll just throw some of uh, the some of the jargon at you so you may google out if you want out of your interest so there is a channel limit there is a channel bandwidth and then there is a link budget uh, which uh, hampers this data rate and ranges so uh, feel free to google this out and uh, uh, let's bring, bring question to officers if you want but uh, for this particular uh, session you just need to know that more data rate means less range okay so moving ahead one might ask that if uh, uh, lower frequencies are providing more range they have better penetration capabilities then why are we using high frequencies then the answer is simple so higher frequencies that is a 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz or 5.8 gigahertz they comes under the ism band and they are widely accepted as free to use uh, band around the world so if you want to buy one transmitter and take it anywhere in, into the world you don't want 900 megahertz maybe you are allowed 900 megahertz in asia but if you are moving to us uh, you cannot use it because uh, it's used uh, by some other uh, cellular communication and uh, lower frequencies are generally used by cellular communication that is the last point in india uh, i think there is 800 megahertz which is reserved for cellular communication that is your mobile communication so obviously you cannot use that uh, that is uh, uh, a link which is uh, assigned to that particular task and you are you don't want to uh, jump into that and 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 uh, and jam that signals or or uh, populate that particular band other reason which uh, you might want to use high frequencies more bandwidth uh, so higher frequencies gives you a more bandwidth uh, there are more channels in in the bandwidth in the same frequency range so I'll give you a simple example if you have ever seen uh, the Wi-Fi uh, router uh, there are uh, Wi-Fi ch uh, channels it says uh, you want to transmit on channel 11 channel 7 so if you don't you just need to log into your router and see on what uh, what channel it is transmitting uh, it is transmitting in 2.4 gigahertz but that is not exactly 2.4 gigahertz it can be 2.40 gigahertz it can be 2.44 gigahertz or it can also be 2.6 gigahertz so this is the entire bandwidth the entire range uh, on which the frequency is divided so uh, more uh, the higher frequencies gives you more bandwidth so you have more number of channels it also helps in uh, frequency hopping so more number of channels you have better you can hop uh, these channels so that is another reason to use high frequencies uh, another thing is small antenna size so lower the frequencies is the bigger antenna size it gets and we'll uh, will will understand that in uh, in in a, in a bit in later slides uh, but uh, for now just understand that lower frequencies need bigger antenna for transmission higher frequencies need smaller antenna for transmission and you do not want to go on a field and take a massive uh, uh, three feet antenna with you uh, for flying a small uh, fpv drone uh, so that is why you need uh, to have high frequencies uh, and again the last point I already mentioned that lower frequencies are generally used for cellular communication and you are not allowed to transmit in that. Another thing which uh, someone may ask is uh, uh, so this uh, uh, radio on the left is transmitting at 10 milliwatt so we need more range how about we increase the power we make it let's say 1 watt so we will get more range so that is true but you can do that so but uh, it's not uh, uh, it's not uh, as uh, simple as it seems uh, there are legal aspects involved there are uh, authorities which are responsible to see that you are under limit and you are not uh, transmitting at very high power uh, increasing the power increases the range but uh, there is something called inverse square law so it doesn't mean that uh, every uh, signal which you are transmitting is receiving to your uh, receiver uh, some signal goes to the open space uh, and they get lost so if you are doubling uh, the if you are doubling the power you do not uh, double the range that never happens it's called inverse square law and we will discuss uh, more about that in the FPV chapter uh, which is uh, due to come uh, there is something called antenna gains uh, antenna also has gain it is not an active component antenna don't have batteries but they have gains something we will also discuss in the FPV chapter not now uh, but uh, for a rule of thumb uh, just know that uh, uh, twice the increase in power is equal to uh, 3 dBi of gain of isotropic antenna so 
so to get uh, so to so to get 3 dbi increase of gain uh, you need to increase the power by 2 so that is uh, a small uh, maths there again you do not need to stress on that we will talk about that later in the fpv chapter but for now uh, these are the answer of why uh, we cannot uh, why uh, we are using high frequencies and why we cannot just simply increase the power to get more range uh, last thing I want to talk about in this particular side is antenna dead zone and that is uh, one topic uh, that I want to uh, take on the iPad uh, that is my whiteboard so let me switch to that and let me show you what I mean by antenna dead zone okay so I am on uh, my whiteboard and I hope I am able to draw yes you can see so uh, in a schematic an antenna is generally uh, represented like this so this is an antenna and uh, if you if you look on my overhead camera and if you look on this transmitter so this is the antenna this is also known as a linear antenna or rubber duck antenna so this kind of antenna it transmits in two direction and this transmit in this direction this is called a lobe and this transmit in this direction this is called another lobe so this is my antenna and this is transmitting in this direction and this is transmitting in this direction and there is no transmission in this direction and there is no transmission in this direction. So these two directions are also known as the dead zone. So you always want to face your antenna uh, this way if you are flying your drone over over here or if you are flying your drone over here but as soon as your antenna of your drone comes in this particular direction or this particular direction it will receive no signal and it will do uh, something called fail safe which we will also di be discussing in another slide uh, but just for now understand that every antenna has dead zone and every antenna is uh, having a particular shape uh, the antenna which we are using on our transmitter it's called uh, linear antenna and the property of linear antenna is uh, it only transmits in uh, this particular lobes so there is no transmission in this direction and it's like a cone so the far you go the far uh, the cone gets bigger the far the transmission is but as soon as uh, the receiver comes in these particular uh, directions then it may lose the signal so uh, make sure to always keep your antenna facing this this way and your drone in this way uh, so this particular property can be changed by changing the type of antenna and there are more antennas like circular polarized antennas or direction antennas. So moving on let's talk about the number of channels. So every transmitter has some channels, every receiver has some channels. So this transmitter which I have has 16 channels and let me uh, move to the overhead camera to uh, show you what are different channels. So so uh, this uh, so this one has one channel for throttle one channel for roll one channel for pitch one channel for yaw so these are four channels apart from that every switch is one channel so these switch are also like channels these joysticks are also like channels these ports on the sides on the back so all these are channels which means every particular channel is uh, sending one uh, one value of data so this is sending one value of data that is pitch this is sending one value of data that is role and you can program these to send different uh, values for example i have programmed this one uh, to change the mode of my drone and we will discuss the uh, mode of the drones in software uh, class where we will talk about what are different modes you can fly on drone so from for going to mode 1 to mode 2 to mode 3 i have used this channel so this is also sending data to my receiver and the data will be passed to the flight controller to do some calculation and on the basis of that calculation the mode of the antenna will change also these joysticks can send some data for example uh, this can send uh, if I want to uh, ascend my drone or I want to descend my drone uh, in, in particular intervals and whatnot. So uh, generally speaking for a drone or for any RC hobby for planes or something you need at least 6 channels. So roll, pitch, yaw, throttle are 4 channels and uh, 2 channels more are good to have. Uh, so information is transmitted over the channels so every channel contain particular uh, uh, type of information uh, for example throttle yaw pitch and roll these are information which is uh, uh, transmitted uh, there are auxiliary channels which we talked about so these are auxiliary channels which you can use to program uh, what value you want to send uh, 
uh, these channels are multiplex and what i mean by that is uh, so you have one frequency and all the information from this channel is going to that one particular uh, frequency one particular uh, radio frequency channel so you need to do some kind of multiplexing so generally it's time division multiplexing that is uh, all the channels are separated by a small time interval so it is easier for receiver to interpret uh, what is the value of throttle what is the value of yaw and so on so receiver and transmitter can have different number of channels for example this uh, transmitter has 16 channels but this receiver only has 6 channels so you can send maximum 6 channels only to this receiver if you try to send more than 6 channels it will uh, discard the uh, channels which uh, are coming after the 6 channel so that's how it works number of channels at rx site matters so obviously because this is uh, the receiver which is going to be mounted on the drone so this receiver is sending data to your flight controller so the channels on your receiver that is the only thing that matters you can have 16 channels here but you can only use six channels because your receiver has the limitation uh, now let's talk about transmitter and receiver protocols and to understand that uh, see this one diagram uh, so this is your radio transmitter this is your receiver and this is your flight controller so your receiver talks to your flight controller uh, and your transmitter talks to your receiver so on the transmitter side uh, you have a transmitter protocol uh, that means the protocol on which this receiver and transmitter talks and on the uh, flight controller side you have the receiver protocol that means how your receiver talks to your flight controller so talking about the TX protocol that defines uh, channel multiplexing, that defines modulation, that defines, uh, defines frequency hopping and error check. Uh, so basically uh, in a nutshell what happens is your transmitter and your receiver both uses uh, a radio frequency chip, a 2.4 gigahertz uh, chipset and uh, on the on the top of that chipset they make their own protocol that how we are sending each channel we are sending throttle first or we are sending yaw first and uh, 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 how frequently we are sending uh, what is the what is the modulation we are using what is the frequency hopping algorithm we are using and what is the error check we are doing so this is mostly a digital signal uh, coming from uh, transmitter to receiver and this is a proprietary so these are not open source these are not protocols defined by the community the transmitter and the receiver manufacturer they decide that protocol so generally speaking you can find the protocols such as uh, d8 and d16 for fr sky transmitters and uh, you can find protocols like fast if you're using a futaba transmitter so these are uh, transmitter companies which make transmitters if you're using a spectrum uh, transmitter then the protocol they are using is called dsm2 or dsmx uh, so uh, uh, your receiver and your transmitter both should understand same protocol so that is uh, why the compatibility comes into the picture you cannot use any receiver with any transmitter they both need to understand each other language they both need to understand each other protocols uh, that is why TX protocols are important and uh, again these are proprietary protocols uh, the manufacturer design them as they want However, on the RX side, uh, the receiver communicates to the flight controller and this communication link uh, we will see in more details in the flight controller chapter. But for, uh, but for now you can uh, you can understand that uh, these protocol can be generic they cannot be uh, they cannot they cannot be proprietary so generally speaking like uh, it can be generic like pulse with modulation uh, uh, pulse uh, position modulation pulse coded modulation so these are uh, kind of modulation techniques uh, used in signal process uh, using signal and digital signal transmissions and whatnot. Uh, we will talk about that in fact in the chapter so don't worry uh, if, if, if if the term scares you for now. Uh, it can also be proprietary like SBUS was developed by Futaba and CRSF is developed by Team Blackship. So these are drone manufacturers. Uh, it can also talk uh, on an analog signal like PWM and PPM are analog in nature. They are not digital signal. They are not zeros and one. They are actually analog waves which are sent out and interpreted by the flight controller. They, but it can also be digital like SBUS and IBUS. These are the protocols which are based on zeros and ones. So digital is of course uh, uh, a better, uh, more reliable signal. Uh, also receiver can send uh, data to uh, data to flight controller uh, in a parallel fashion like for example if this receiver has four channels throttle pitch yaw and roll so each channel can have one wire of itself throttle can have one wire going to the uh, flight controller from receiver yaw can have another wire so each wire carries one channel 
uh, that is called parallel communication so example of parallel communication is pwm protocol uh, but this receiver can also send all the data in single wire like i have seen here so uh, red is uh, red and black are the power for receiver and yellow is a single wire on which all the data of uh, throttle yaw pitch roll and auxiliary channels are transmitted so example of serial protocols are s bus where only one wire is used for every uh, for all the all the channels while on the parallel each channel will get one wire of its own uh so a uh, few takeaways so one transmitter can offer multiple protocols for example there could be one transmitter in the market which can do d8 d16 and also do dsm2 uh tx and rx protocol are inter are not interdependent that means tx protocol can be different rx protocol can be different uh you may have rx that speaks uh, uh, d8 and that speaks pwm and also s bus uh, but uh, they are not uh, mutually dependent and, and they don't uh, define if you are restricted uh, by particularly one kind of protocols that is not the case uh, end of the day it's all about latency so all these protocols so the question is why do we need all kind of protocols why do we need d8 d16 here why do we need pwm and, and s bus here so it's all about latency so as as uh, the demand for fast and fast drones fast and fast signal processing comes into picture as uh, more research are happening in these areas the latency is going down and these uh, new protocols they are uh, they provide uh, more real time communication and less latency okay so in the uh, last uh, slide i told you that uh, the transmitter which uh, we are having out of the box they can uh, transmit at 2.4 gigahertz and 10 milliwatt but uh, that doesn't mean you need to uh, restrict on that frequencies on that power level uh, some good transmitters like the one i'm having here they have uh, something called a jr bay which is exactly like an extension port uh, where you can put external modules and increases its uh, capability so for example you can add something called lrs which is known as long range system or uh, uhf called ultra high frequencies so this is the kind of module i'm talking about you can see on the photo this one is uh, easy uhf by a company called immersion rc it's an ultra high frequency uh, module and this is a, a team black ship crossfire uh, an lrs module or long range system module as it called so on the back of the transmitter i'll uh, show you on my transmitter so on the back you uh, you have a port which uh, you can open up and you can see there are some pins on which uh, uh, the external modules can be connected and this uh, this increases the range and it increases the capability so uh, what you are doing here is uh, basically uh, you are increasing the capability of a transmitter you are changing the frequency because uh, this uh, module runs on different frequency if i remember correctly it works on 900 megahertz and it can change power level up to 1 watt so you can uh, increase the power level if you if you already have permissions to do that and uh, if you have programmed uh, the model correctly uh, there are some programming uh, might be required some configuration might be required but uh, basically you can uh, change the frequency you can change the protocol so by default uh, this transmitter works on d8 protocol as i uh, told you in the lux in the next slide but this uh, module has its protocol on its own it's called csrf so you can do that so not every transmitter has that so only the good uh, a bit expensive transmitter provide you these capabilities but again it's very flexible and one of the good thing which you can do is you can also make some diy modules like uh, on the left you can see a picture of nrf 24 module which is a very common uh, module rf used with arduino and you can control your own uh, uh, homemade drones own homemade uh, uh, transmitters or uh, a small drone if you have made uh, using these kinds of radio so uh overall uh, these uh, transmitters so uh, run some open source firmware so if i talk about my transmitter it runs an open source firmware called open tx and you can change the code you can uh, you can uh, you can program your own external modules you can take uh, the advantage of this uh, jr bay where you can plug external modules so basically what you are doing is uh, you are disabling the internal uh, radio chip and you are enabling the external radio chip which you have plugged and uh, basic uh, you and based on that you can uh, you can attach uh, uh, these modules to different uh, receiver different uh, antennas and you can get different frequencies and protocol so that is the entire idea of making it modular and extended uh, extending its capabilities uh, so this is a transmitter and it talks to a receiver but this receiver can also talk back to transmitter and this concept is known as telemetry a very powerful concept and let's understand why you want your receiver to talk back to your transmitter so receiver is mounting mounted on your drone 
transmitter is in your hand so why do you want your receiver to talk to the uh, talk to your transmitter so it's it's very simple you want your uh, you want to have the knowledge of your drone current gps uh, coordinates you want to know the current battery status you want to know the current speed so this can be done with the the receiver but the question is so this is a small receiver this does not have a gps inbuilt this does not have a uh, a voltage sensor or a speed sensor then how this receiver is uh, passing this data to the transmitter back the answer is very simple this receiver is talking to the flight controller the flight controller knows all these the flight controller can send this data to receiver and receiver can send back to the uh, transmitter so basically this is not a receiver this is a trans receiver it can also transmit so that is a powerful concept and this is known as telemetry uh, we will see in the greater details and uh, if i if i go to the overhead uh, camera welcome to open tx you might heard that my transmitter speaks to me so when i'm flying with the goggles on and i want to know my battery status i can flick a switch like this so for that uh, i need to program it so i can flick a switch like this and it will speak the current battery to me i can uh, flick a switch like this and it can tell me the current flight time so uh, this is the powerful concept called telemetry that is sending data back to the ground station and uh, receivers like this uh, can do that so you'll see two antennas uh, that is not for redundancy one antenna is to receive and another antenna is to transfer back to the ground station okay so uh, let's move ahead and talk about the antenna uh, so basically uh, on the receiver side the length of antenna or the shape of antenna that doesn't really matter uh, it does matter but not at uh, that extent at, as it matter to a transmitter because a transmitter is uh, sending signal out at a power and if the receiver is uh, not good the uh, sorry the antenna is not good the antenna is sketchy or the antenna is uh, not uh, designed properly the there is no impedance matching there is a concept called impedance matching that uh, is used everywhere in electronics so if antenna is not particularly matched for that frequency and because uh, the transmitter is sending signal out in some power uh, it can burn the transmitter because there is no way the signal is going out the transmitter wants the signal to go out via an antenna but the antenna is crappy it will burn the transmitter so the design of antenna is uh, very crucial there uh, so uh, you 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 might be you might be thinking that Ayan, you told us that uh, on higher frequencies the antenna length is very small that is why we use higher frequencies we are using 2.4 gigahertz which is very high frequencies then why we are having such a big antenna and if i if i take you to an overhead camera uh, you can see the length of antenna is quite big so this is my receiver and this is uh, the antenna it's 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 quite big as you can see here so this is uh, my receiver and this is the overall length of the antenna which is quite significant big uh, so you might be thinking that why is that even though we are using high frequencies uh, i'll i'll say that uh, this is not a big antenna you just need this uh, small length the exposed length it is also known as the active element of this antenna so this is very small you can see so only this uh, exposed length matter and this length uh, which is covered does not matter uh, this is just there to provide you uh, with some extra length so in case uh, you crash your drone the antenna breaks you can peel off uh, uh, this length back and you get back the active element so this is uh, nothing but a coaxial wire which is having uh, 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 having a wire inside it a coaxial wire inside it and only this exposed length matters so you can see how small is that only that length is matter for the transmission and this is just uh, to have some extra length in case you you break this you can peel off back and you can get your get the good range back uh, so range is very sensitive to length of the antenna and if you cut a small piece here let's say even one millimeter you will get very bad range you will start uh, having signal losses so uh, make sure to have a proper uh, range uh, so again the same point when i say that uh, uh, my transmitter and receiver works on 2.4 gigahertz i mean the 2.4 gigahertz band and this is the entire frequency band which may range from 2.4 to 2.8 gigahertz and so on so uh, how do we calculate this length of this exposed antenna uh, how do i know what should be the length of my exposed antenna so it's a simple formula so the wavelength can be calculated by uh, dividing frequency in gigahertz by 300 so um, the, the the band is 2.4 gigahertz which range from 2.40 to 2.8 so let's take 2.44 gigahertz as the middle band so if we divide 300 by 2.44 we will get 122.95 millimeter of wavelength 
and the length of antenna is wavelength divided by 4. So 122.95 divided by 4 is equal to 31 millimeter. So 31 millimeter or 3.1 centimeter is the only antenna of active element you need on your receiver. So that's how small it is. Receiver connection with the flight controller. We will discuss that in flight controller, but I've already mentioned that there are two kind of connection you can do between the receiver and the flight controller. One is the parallel where each channel have its own uh, connection. Throttle has its own connection, roll has its own uh, on wire, pitch has its own wire and so on. In the serial, there is only one wire and all the data of all channels is transmitted to that particular wire. There is one thing that uh, I need to mention that is called fail safe that I already showed you on the whiteboard that there uh, that this antenna transmits in two lobes on the left and the side because it's designed that way. So on the center there is a dead zone and uh, that is where the fail safe happens. So what is a fail safe? So uh, this uh, transmitter and receiver had a particular range. Let's say it has one kilometer range. And if you exceed that range, if you take your drone below uh, beyond one kilometer, you will lose the signal or you will lose the signal if you come into the dead zone. So one thing in the drone which will trigger uh, when you lose the signal uh, to your transmitter, it's called fail safe. So what is a fail safe? Fail safe is a situation which happens when uh, the transmitter and receiver can no longer communicate. Maybe they are out of range, maybe there is some interference, whatever, they are not able to communicate and a situation of fail safe happen. As a drone uh, builder, as a drone uh, pilot, you have uh, the liberty to choose what you want to do when this situation happen. So one thing which you want to do is uh, cut off the motor and let the drone fall as a rock. One thing you can do is let the drone fly as uh, the same altitude it's flying. Uh, one thing you can do is let the drone ascend very slowly. So depending on that, you can program in your flight controller what you want to do when the situation of fails have happened. Uh, the last thing I want to show, we need to go to the overhead camera. So I have uh, I have done a small setup here. So this is my transmitter and uh, I have one receiver here, uh, which is connected to two motors, uh, one servo motor and one brushless DC motor. So how do my transmitter know? So how do my transmitter know that it needs to talk to this uh, receiver? So we need to do something called binding of receiver. So I need to bind my receiver to my transmitter and every receiver has different process to bind it. Uh, in this particular one, I don't remember, but uh, there is one button or you need to short some, uh, some pins and connect to the battery. For example, in this receiver, there is one button here. You need to, uh, you need to put your transmitter in binding mode. You need to press the button and you need to power it on and it will bind together. Uh, so you need to uh, consult the documentation of your particular transmitter and your receiver and you can able to bind that. Uh, but over here I am already bounded Number these two. So this receiver is this receiver is bounded to my transmitter and I uh, want to show how it uh, rotates this motor. So I'll, I need to give power to this. Okay, so I have bounded this uh, receiver to my transmitter already. Uh, this is the receiver and this is bounded to my transmitter already. You can the see the green light. Lost. And uh, I have connected the servo motor to the roll uh, axis. So if I if I do roll, you can see the servo is moving on the roll axis. There will be no another movement on any other axis because it is on the roll axis. So I have connected my roll axis to the servo and I have connected throttle to this motor. So you can see as I give throttle, the motor Now I want to show you the fail safe situation where what I will do, I will uh, power up the motor and I will switch off the transmitter and see what will happen. So I'll power up the motor and I, switch, and I switch off my transmitter. And you see, as soon as the transmission uh, signal is lost, the, trans the motor stopped. That was all for today's class. I hope uh, you uh, get to know a lot of different things about uh, frequency and transmitters and frame selection and there are some myths uh, you would be having before that that is now solved. So uh, thank you very much for joining and I look forward to seeing you all in the office hours. Uh, so thank you very much and see you in the next class.